he will be a staff for the righteous with which for them to stand and not to fall. And he will be the light of the nations and the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. All who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship him, and they will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. First Enoch chapter 48, verses 4 through 5. The modern world doesn't acknowledge, but is nevertheless haunted by spirits, angels, demons, and saints. In our time, many yearn to break free of the prison of a flat, secular materialism, to see and to know reality as it truly is. What is this spiritual reality like? How do we engage with it well? How do we permeate everyday life with spiritual presence? Orthodox Christian priests Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung host this live call-in show focused on enchantment in creation, the union of the seen and unseen as made by God and experienced by mankind throughout history. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits. Welcome back to the Lord of Spirits podcast. I am Father Andrew Stephen Damick in the borough of Emmaus in the beautiful snow-blanketed Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And with me is my co-host, Father Stephen DeYoung, in Lafayette, Louisiana, where it never really gets truly cold. And if you're listening to us live, you can call in at 855-AF-RADIO. That's 855-237-2346. And we will get to your calls in the second part of today's show. So have you ever noticed that worship is never defined in the Bible? There's no place in which it says, and this is what worship is. Now, we do get very detailed instructions for worship, especially in the book of Leviticus. And then there are bits and pieces in the New Testament. But worship happens long before any of those texts are written. In fact, we see it happening in Genesis chapter 4 with the sons of Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel offer sacrifice to God. It's not explained, not defined, not placed with any, within any existing religious ritual context. Cain and Abel make sacrifices to God. If we're going to understand the sacrifices of Cain and Abel, as well as worship in the ancient world in general, and indeed Christian worship up until our own time, we need to understand the ritual context of the ancient world. What did the earliest worship look like? Was there a lot of variation? Did different cultures come up with very different ways of worshiping their gods? So let's think back now as best as we're able, to thousands of years ago, to the earliest known human settlements. And they happen to be found in what is now modern-day Turkey and the Holy Land. So, Father Stephen, take us back. So, first I'll have you know, it is a deeply chilly 46 degrees here. (laughs) And... uh, the, the UPS driver brought me a p- package earlier and was literally wearing a parka and gloves. <laughs> so uh, the cold is just a different standard down here. That's um, right. and, and also, before we get started tonight, we should probably let people know uh, that, like Gaul, our discussion of sacrifice has been divided in three parts. <laughs> Indeed. Right. <laughs> and not just three parts in this episode. This is the first of three episodes about sacrifice. So... We can hear there's a whole bunch of cheering happening all over the all over the world right now. I'm sure, <laughs> in response to that. So, so yes, yeah, so hopefully. so this this yeah. is this is this is part one, where we're going to be talking about sacrifice in the ancient world. Yeah, and uh, as is our want, we're going to go back and start at the very beginning, as you mentioned, uh, which is in the Neolithic period, the Stone Age. Yeah, um, and Stone Age religion. So. Uh, I'll do our date disclaimer. Um, <laughs> that's that's important. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm going to give dates, which are the dates established by archaeologists. Uh, this isn't based on carbon dating or paleontology. This is, we're talking about human settlements. So this is standard layer archaeology. Uh, some listeners may have a commitment to the idea that the earth is not as old as some of these settlements are purported to be. Right. Uh, if so, do not allow this to trouble you. These are circa <laughs> dates. Adjust them accordingly. But however you, however long or short you feel the timeline is, uh, these are the earliest human settlements either way. 
right? Yeah, These and, and, it, and, and it ultimately ones. doesn't, right, it ultimately does not matter to what we're going to be talking about exactly how old they are, uh, you know, so anyway. Yeah, just the, the, old, the oldest ones we've found. Exactly. Right. Yes. Right. Um, so now we get to say some some phrases and words that are very hard to pronounce unless you happen to be from Turkey. Yeah. Yeah. Then I don't know. They may even be. Yeah. If we have any actual um, Turks listening, we're like, oh, man, they're saying that so yeah, wrong. We're, we're sorry in we're advance. Sorry. Yep. Um, so the, th the three earliest sites, and we're going to discuss two of these in some detail, uh, the oldest continually continuously inhabited human site that we've uncovered uh is actually jericho right in the holy which land. is in the holy land the jericho that's in the bible but um uh, although it's where exactly the settlement is has shifted around a little bit in the area uh um, right. there's been human settlement there dated by archaeologists back to circa 10,000 bc right uh so uh that's that's how far back we're going. So we're going back um, at least some millennia before uh, the civilizations of Babylon, before even Sumerian civilization. Yeah. Uh, and there's, so these, there's, no, there's no writing uh, at this point, right, that anyone right. is aware of. Right. There's, there's no writing. Uh, so we don't have written texts. We have sort of the remains of people living and doing things. Yeah. Uh, and these aren't really cities. That's why we're saying settlements. Right. Um, Sumeria is where you start getting cities as such. Um, yeah. So these are just places where previously nomadic people put down roots. And we'll be talking about that more in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then the two that we're going to discuss in more detail, the first is Gobekli Tepe, uh, which is... Uh, one of the sites in what's now Turkey, uh, in yeah, Asia. Yeah, south, south, yeah, southeastern Turkey, right near the Syrian border. Uh, right. And and uh, that site again is dated by archaeologists. The beginning of the settlement to somewhere around ninety one thirty BC, um, flourishing around nine thousand BC, and then uh, the second one is uh, Chatalhoyuk. Uh, which dates from a little later, from around 7100 BC, as it's just a couple thousand right. years later. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so wow. Yeah. So one uh, Gobekli Tepe represents one of the first hu permanent human settlements, uh, and then uh, Chetelhoyak represents a sort of later, a little bit later phase in the development of human settlements and villages. Uh, yeah. Based on what we actually find there in the dirt, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Gobekli Tepe, um, we're, in some sense, I'm about to try and do TV on the radio because I'm about to talk about <laughs> monoliths, which, of course, I can't show you pictures of. <laughs> right? Yeah, but but if you if you happen to go onto our, our, our Lord of Spirits podcast Facebook page, uh, we actually did post some pictures from these sites, so you can see some of this uh, if you go to Facebook and and look at this. There, there are a few things there. So, but yes, right now we're going to play. Imagine if you will. It's the theater of the mind. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, there are uh, very early monoliths, monolithic structures, uh, stone standing stone structures uh, at. Gobekli Tepe, um, they're arranged, uh, it will be reminiscent to some people probably when you look at pictures of Stonehenge is probably the, uh, the closest thing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I have wistful feelings about Stonehenge. Uh, oh, is this where we get where you finally tell the no, story? I'm, I'm not going to oh, tell the man. story, but I, oh. I have been banned for life from Stonehenge. Um, <laughs> the exact circumstances <laughs> will remain a mystery for now. Um, but that, that's, uh, you know that's going to be a Lord of Spirits T-shirt at some point. Yeah, banned for life from Stonehenge. Yeah, banned from Stonehenge. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> but what, what's really striking about these particular monoliths at Gobekli Tepe is the carvings. I think. Yeah. For anybody right. seeing them, 
Right. Um, if you if you look at our Facebook page and see these pictures, and also there's a Wikipedia page, uh, which is you know has lots and lots of pictures, and there's there's animal carvings on these things on these standing stones. Yeah, and um, it is unclear to archaeologists and anthropologists exactly how to interpret the animal carvings or even if they should be interpreted right because interpreted implies that it's some kind of pictographic language and it may not have been that it may have just been representations of animals Um, but they're arranged in a way that suggests that they were used for some kind of astrological observation yeah much like Uh, stonehenge much like much like stonehenge was uh in in the uh ancient world uh, but all of this point, what all this points to is that the remains there are not the remains of sort of a village that was constructed to do commerce. Right. Right. Or that was um, pulled together because someone set himself up as a chieftain or a king. Yeah. It's not set near some, you know, natural resource. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. And so what it is, it's the remains of a ritual site. Right. And so there had been um, in the past sort of a a consensus among scholars that the first uh, human settlements developed uh, for sort of practical material reasons. Right. And that uh, then once that happened, they started developing religious beliefs and, and other elements of culture. Yeah, just like, uh, you know, in, in happened in the early American West, they built a town and then, oh, I guess we should probably build a church or something. Right. Yeah. And, and, right. And uh, what they're finding with Gobekli Tepe and a few other uh, Chalcolithic sites is that the exact opposite is true. Hmm. Uh, that these, these first sites were actually ritual sites. And began as places of pilgrimage. So nomadic peoples and people groups, tribes, clans would make some sort of periodic pilgrimage uh, to these sites. And, uh, And so the need to service those pilgrims and the ritual needs of the site actually then gave birth to the settlement. Right. So what we're talking about here is is it's not really a single event, but a, a development in history that's referred to as the Neolithic revolution. And that's the move from, uh, humans being nomadic and hunting food and gathering food. And if you're going to hunt and gather food, you sort of have to be nomadic because you have to move with the seasons in terms of being able to gather food. And you have to move with the migration of animals. If you're going to hunt, food yeah right which which you know um if if you think about the ancient world being nomadic is the smartest way to be right because if you stay in one place then you know you could get attacked easily by your rivals uh you know staying in one place also means you're subject to all the seasons of that place Right. Um, you know, to, as, as I think you just said to migratory animals, you know, it, it doesn't make sense not to move around. So we, we think that the way human beings live now is normally set. I mean, obviously, most human beings in this world right now are settled. <laughs> you know, they live in places and they don't move around. So right. it seems obvious that that's the norm. But it was really not the norm uh, early on, really, really not the norm and not really a very good idea. So it would have to be a really important reason for you to actually build something somewhere and then sort of stick with it. Right. Yeah. Right. And so um, it happens sort of in the, the reverse of what was previously assumed, that this ritual site has a need for people to dwell there permanently, uh, and it has a need um, for... Uh, for uh, food, um, so you got to supply it developed right? for the pilgrims and for sacrificial rituals, as we're going to be talking about for most of tonight. Uh, those things uh, have to be um, have to be provided, and so that causes the shift then to agriculture and to the domestication of animals, 
because we have to be able to produce food at the site. Yeah. Regardless of the season, regardless of the, we have to be able to, and then after producing food, we have to be able to store it. Um, right. There's going to be guests all the time. So you got to keep the place stocked. Right. And so these material changes to life are, are the product of the religious significance of the site. Right. Uh, which suggests something further. Right. And, and this, this shift that I'm talking about to seeing the, the religious and ritual significance of the place first and then the settlement is a shift that's being made by um, scholars who are atheists, right? This isn't, this yeah. isn't a, a religiously motivated thing. Uh, this is where the evidence points. But as religious people, right, we, we could assess something further that for this site to become a pilgrimage site, for it to become a religious site to which people would travel uh, from different clans and different groups that are otherwise nomadic, uh, there had to be some kind of actual spiritual or religious experience there. Yeah, there's a significance to that spot. Yeah, that that's you know? ex it, that was experienced by people, and it can't just be like one person, right? So, I mean, if one person yeah. comes out of the woods and says, "Hey, I met the great god, you know, Pazuzu out in the <laughs> out in the woods," right? That's not going to cause even the members of his own group to all go out in the woods and try and find it. Right. Right. It has to be a repeated thing, you know, right. like, like, you know, when people discovered and, and on a much lesser sense, when people discover the grand Canyon, Hey, come take a look at this. And people have the same experience every time they go. Uh, but in this case, it's an experience where people are saying that they encountered a, a being, a spiritual being. Right. It's yeah. a, it's an experience of uh, spiritual reality. Um, in the uh, in the ancient world, that causes then this to become a pilgrimage site, and then leads to leads to the settlement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, you know, it, it, even now, right? So I mean, there are parallels to that. For instance, in Orthodox Christian experience, where, like, like for example, uh, Trinity Saint Sergius Monastery in Russia, right? This is. This was founded by St. Sergius of Radonezh, who basically went out of the woods to pray by himself. Um, but now if you go there, it is not only a massive monastic complex, but it's a city. Like, it is literally a city. And the reason why the monastery was formed was because of St. Sergius being there, uh, who, you know, because he's a saint, he's he becomes a vessel of grace, right? And so people go there to experience that as well. And then the city grows up around it. So it's, I mean, it's exactly the same pattern. It's exactly the same pattern. And it makes a lot of sense. I mean, and, and once again, this kind of just shows that modern people tend to think, uh, even if they are religious, they tend to think of religion as a kind of add-on, even of maybe the most important add-on in their life, but a kind of add-on. Whereas what makes you in the ancient world where everybody is mobile wants to actually build something and start to raise crops and that kind of thing? It must be something super important, you know, um, and, and all signs point to that super important thing being a spiritual experience. Right. And, and you see something similar to this in, in the scriptures as well, where the patriarchal narratives in Genesis Right. You know, Jacob has his experience at Bethel and he builds an altar of 12 stones or right. Joshua setting up the stones at the place where the Jordan River was parted. And then yeah. people coming back to see those spots and see the stones that are erected. Yeah. Um, yep. uh, and then, of course, the church building churches on top of all the places where great events in the history of salvation happened. Right. Right. On Mount Tabor and on, <laughs> right? yeah. on the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, so, yeah, the idea that these ex these spiritual experiences sort of consecrate a place is not just an ancient Stone Age thing. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a universal uh, human thing. Yeah. And I and I think there's also a problem for modern people trying to apprehend this because especially those who live in, say, the United States, because our population tends to be so mobile and so uncommitted to the places that they're from. You know, people tend to move for whatever reason, usually a job or whatever. Um, and the idea that you would 
that place actually is an important thing is just not it's just not a thing. I mean, I mean, just for instance, right now, you know, you're in Louisiana, I'm in Pennsylvania, headquarters is in Indiana, and people are listening to us all over the world. And I mean, this is a good thing, but it is a fundamentally displaced thing. You know, it's, it's, and, and so I, I think that's another problem with, with, you know, like the modern skeptical mind, if you say, well, this is the place where Jesus was born. And so there's a church here. The modern skeptical mind would say, is that really where he was born? Because we tend to think that place is actually not that important, right? Whereas in the ancient world, it was super important. Some, this thing happened here and it keeps happening here. So we better pay attention to this, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. Our, our tendency, our overall tendency to etherealize religion and make it a yeah. mental and intellectual exercise. Right. Um, right. Which has nothing to do with place, space time yeah stuff <laughs> right <laughs> things yeah, yeah objects <laughs> reality yeah. yeah um so uh moving on to the next one right Chavo yeah. Hoyak, which as we said is is uh a couple millennia later site uh this we have more permanent structures in the form of domiciles uh, mm. these aren't sort of separate houses these are sort of buildings broken up into rooms each of which room was a residence uh, likely for a family. Right. Uh, and uh, there's all kinds of interesting, neat stuff. But of religious significance um, is uh, there are already um, burial sites there where people are burying their dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and the custom at that time was apparently to bury uh, their... Uh, deceased family members under the floor. It was, of course, a dirt floor. Uh, right. But bury them in the floor of the family house, the family. So above. they're kind of always with you. Right. Yeah. Uh, actually, in the in the floor. Uh, but in those burial sites, we find uh, what are called grave goods, meaning yeah. stuff. Yeah, look, um, you're, you're going to need this in the next world. So right. here you go. I mean, my, my, most people probably are aware, for instance, that the pharaohs are buried inside the pyramids with all kinds of stuff. And it's the same thing. It's the right. exact same the, thing. This is, well, well uh, this with is more like a, stuff. a flint, yeah, a flint knife. Yeah, and, you know. <laughs> yeah right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Don't forget your sack lunch, you know. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, and not here's your thousand to, slave. Yeah, about 20,000. <laughs> 20 tons of gold. Yeah. yeah um, right. <laughs> yeah. But, yes. uh, but also found with them are animal remains, uh, which suggests that, um, and they're found with, with the human remains. Right. So yeah. it's not that they had a pet sheep and they really loved it. So they buried it with grandma. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, these were sacrificial animals. Yeah that were being uh, sort of sent along with the burial. Um, so we know that sacrifice was taking place uh, at this uh, at this point already. Um, and then uh, we also find there uh, our sort of earliest window into uh, what spirits they were worshiping uh, at Chattelhoyak. Yeah. Uh, at this ancient point. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting to me to look at the photos. And like the, the one thing that I noticed the most often was the heads of bulls, you know, yes. like and, and it seemed like they weren't. They weren't bull skulls. These were like carved bull heads. You know, they were images of bulls. Yeah, with huge um, horns. Like with huge, huge horns, right? And and they collected, for instance, inside one of these dwellings, they they have at, at that at uh, Chetelhoyak, uh, they have um, a, a sort of a recreation of a domicile. And one of the pictures, and again, we posted this on our Facebook page. One of the pictures, you see a whole sort of vertical row of these bull heads in the corner of the the home. You know, and and um, this is not, you know, this is not someone showing off their hunting trophies. Because again, these are these are images that are made. They're not actual bullhorns, right? Right. Yeah. This is a this is a chalcolithic uh, icon corner. Yeah. Uh, is, is what this is. Um, 
the the and, and these bullheads are found in all, almost every domicile, almost every home. Yeah. Uh, usually in a specific area. Uh, right. So implying that it's sort of a home shrine uh, yeah. that has this bullhead in it, and so uh, the the depiction of a male god as a bull. Uh, while we find it here, is is ubiquitous in the ancient world. So you right. get in the Epic of Gilgamesh the bull of heaven. Yeah, uh, or in, or in Greek myth, you've got the Europa, you know, Zeus appearing as a bull, and the Minotaur. One of my favorite stories from when I was a kid. Right. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, the bull Baal. There's a whole segment of Baal worship that surrounded Baal as a bull. Right. That's uh, the golden calf, right? Right, the the golden well, the golden calf may have actually been an apis bull from Egypt, but again, that's oh, another instantiation another bull of this idea, right? Yeah, of of this great bull. the The form uh, that that bull takes, in terms of its name, that we find in, for example, the Hebrew Scriptures, is this is where Behemoth comes from, which is actually right. Behemoth uh, in Hebrew. Uh, Behemoth is the word for like cow or cattle. Uh, it's actually grammatically feminine. Um, and behemot is the feminine plural. Uh, right. But it's a plural of majesty. Like sometimes people will point out that uh, God is referred to as Elohim, which is technically plural. Um, and it's a way of elevating him. This is, uh, it's sort of like a way of saying this is the bull. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, much like even royal, you know, our sort of stereotypes of royalty referring to themselves as we. You know, <laughs> right, we are yeah. not amused. <laughs> we, yeah. we, you know, yes, right, right. So the this is the bull, uh, the bull, behemoth. But even though it's this male figure and it's this sort of image of sort of male power uh, and strength and uh, and rule, it's grammatically feminine. Right. Uh, and then the other figure that we see already at Chetelhoyuk is a number of carved uh, goddess figures. And uh, the goddess figures there are related to another figure uh, that's pretty much ubiquitous. Uh, and that's not a mother goddess figure, actually. <laughs> right. Um, it's actually a figure related to the sea. Yes. To the waters. Uh, and, and thereby monster. to chaos. So this is a sea monster. Yes. And, Dragons. <laughs> and this takes the form... Uh, in the Hebrew scriptures of uh, Leviathan, which is an English uh, transliteration of what's well, actually more like Lotan uh, in in uh, the Semitic roots. Uh, right. But this 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 figure again appears everywhere. Baal fights it. Uh, Tiamat is sort of the Babylonian form. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, or or Marduk would, would the would the mid, would the Midgard serpent be a, a you know in Norse mythology? Um, sort of, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gaia in in the Titan Gaia in in Greek uh, myth is actually closely related to this. People point mm. out, well, that's that's the Earth, and so people think of her as this Earth Mother figure. But if you actually read the stories, uh, she's all about getting revenge for the Titans, her children. And she mm -hmm. does that by bringing monsters up out of the sea, like Typhon. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and um, and yeah. so you have these sort of two figures. And, and, and Leviathan or Lotan is actually grammatically masculine, even though it's a feminine figure. Yeah. Yeah. So both of them have this swap. And so you have these two figures. And uh, those the sort of the denouement of those two figures in our Bible is in the book of revelation where they turn up as the beast from the earth and the beast from the sea. Yeah. Behemoth and, and, and Leviathan. Right. And, and, you know, so while Leviathan kind of represents this chaos, which, I mean, which if you think about this symbolically, right, you look at the, the ocean, that is an image of chaos, constant movement. It's uncontrollable. It's destructive, you know, and then, and then Behemoth um, is this image of, of, tyranny um and i remember when we were having the conversation earlier to prepare for this you know there's sort of the idea that one is what you might describe as kind of toxic masculinity the sort of tyrannous image and then the other sort of toxic femininity um you know that uh, and 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 again toxic 
<laughs> not normal. Toxic. Yeah. 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 Right. Not good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. right. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, these become sort of ubiquitous figures in, in ancient, in ancient religion. Uh, and knowing that that's who they are, uh, pro- provides a lot of uh, contour, right? So the gold, not just the golden calf, but Jeroboam's golden calves at Bethel and Dan. Mm. Um, and sort of all the, the undercurrents that are running all through the scriptures of these two sort of spirits being uh, these sort of primary spirits opposed to Yahweh, yeah. the God of Israel. Uh, and we already see evidence of them being worshipped this far back. You know, at the end of the the Neolithic age or the beginning of the Chalcolithic, right? Um, yeah, and it's an interesting question, and I, we'll, we'll get to this in a second. But I just want to raise this: Why would you want to worship spirits that are so horrifyingly problematic? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, there wasn't cancel culture yet, so they couldn't get rid of them. That's right. Exactly. There was no social and, media and, to ban them. How, from. Yeah, and um, how, yeah. How, how do you, yeah? Yes. How exactly would you cancel? <laughs> Leviathan, a sea monster yeah, yeah right exactly yeah. Uh, but so th- this is uh, what we see regardless of what culture we want to talk about whether we're talking about early Greek culture ancient Near Eastern cultures early Canaanite culture Egyptian uh, Mesopotamian uh, the earliest shrines are these kind of places uh, yeah. Before there are even temples per se, where they start building a building around it, you have some place, be it a high place, an elevated place, or uh, be it a particular tree or a spring of water, where these encounters with spirits take place. Yeah. And then a hedge or a fence or some kind of border is constructed around it. Right to designate right. And, it as a sacred space. Yeah, and and this this persists throughout the entire history of humanity, right? Like I've I've been reading lately um, both Finnish and Norse mythology, and you know the Finns had what they called I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce this. Sorry, Finns. Hisi H I I S I, which the most ancient version of that word refers to a a place. But then eventually the word came to refer to a spirit that kind of inhabited the place. Um, and sometimes, you know, most of the time people would avoid them. <laughs> and sometimes they would go there specifically to kind of encounter them. Uh, and, and you get the same thing, in, in, again, in Norse mythology where, like, there's a particular, I think in, in northern England somewhere, there's actually a particular bog or something like this where there's indications. It's either in northern England or maybe in Scandinavia. There's indications that people were being sacrificed to Thor and but but the place was named as a place sacred to Thor because that's where you would go to encounter him. It was a specific sacred place, you know. Yeah, and and every every religion, every single religion, has stuff like this. Whatever permutation right. you're talking about, yeah. right? And, and and this is what then develops into the idea that again these are high places and and these sort of designated sacred spaces and groves and and natural features to the idea of the gods living in gardens and or on mountains right um because those are the places where they were encountered uh by people and this is where the whole idea the whole word paradise and the whole idea of paradise as this walled garden uh, yeah on top of a mountain comes from that imagery yeah Um, develops from this so uh, as we prepare to segue into our uh, next bit, uh, our next part, our second half, um, you asked about why you'd want to worship these. Well, yeah, right. It's a good question. Like, why not just right. avoid? I mean, these are big, scary, you know, monsters of chaos and tyranny. I mean, why, you know, just run away, right? Right. So, if, if you think about it, if you're a nomadic tribe or clan or family group or however you want to construct it, part of this, this group, this social unit that's nomadic, and you encounter other humans, right, another group of humans, uh, you have various options, right? 
Um, the two most obvious would be if you think your group is bigger and stronger, you could try to subdue them, conquer them, kill them, take their stuff. Right. Um, uh, right. But now if you encounter, you know, Leviathan, the queen of the stone age, uh, proverbially, right? Like you can't kill her and take her stuff. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so yeah. that, that option's right out. So the option that remains to you is the option that would remain to you if you met a bigger group of people or just another group of people who you didn't want to attack. And that's to make peace and make friends and establish a relationship and some kind of fellowship and some kind of communion with these other people you've encountered. Right. Because they're a threat or because you want them or, you know, but in, in the case of, you know, demons, um, <laughs> as a Christian would understand these beings to be, um, you just don't want them to destroy you. Um, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. You want to try and be fr be on their good side and be friends with them, even though we know from a Christian perspective, that's not possible. Um, and, and it's kind of a bad idea. And so establishing <laughs> that relationship and that rapport, uh, especially through the offering of hospitality becomes the purpose of the rituals that happen at these ritual sites. Yep. Right. Yep. It becomes a, a guest house for spirits and for all those who want to eat with them. Yeah. So, well, having said that, then we're going to go ahead and uh, go to break. And when we come back, we will start to take your calls. So we'll be right back. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. So here's a question for you. What does it mean to think orthodox? What are the unspoken and unexplored premises and presumptions underlying what Christians believe? Orthodox Christianity is based on preserving the mind of the early church, its phronima. Dr. Jeannie Constantino brings her more than 40 years experience as a professor, Bible teacher, and speaker to bear in explaining what the Orthodox phronema is how it can be acquired, and how that phronema is expressed in true Orthodox theology, as practiced by those who are properly qualified by both training and a deep relationship with Christ. Thinking Orthodox, now available at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. All right, well, welcome back. This is the second part of our show, and uh, it's where we begin to take your calls. So we just talked for a little bit about why, um, why anyone would want to... <laughs> have a relationship with a demonic chaos monster um, <laughs> or giant bull as the or case, giant you know, bull be fair, be fair. right right kind of depends are you inland or are you near, yeah. near the ocean uh, <laughs> you know um, and and we we ended up by saying that it's because you don't want to be destroyed by them and and uh, so then the proper response to that is hospitality to offer hospitality and so that's what we're going to be talking about now in this the second part of our show so please do call in again it's 855-AF-RADIO um, 855-237-2346 and uh, we would love to talk to you so all right so father I mean we, we in these ancient ancient super ancient sites that we've just been talking about <laughs> there's no writing we just have kind of material stuff to kind of go by um, but it gives a pretty clear picture that there is dedication to these these beings and so forth. But we don't know what exactly that looks like. What are the actual actions? I mean, archaeology doesn't can't show you what people do. When's the earliest that we actually begin to know, uh, have some clue about what this hospitality that was being offered actually looked like? Right, right. Uh, well... Uh, we have, I mean, we have lots of ancient ritual texts, uh, but 
the way ancient ritual texts were written, for example, in the ancient Near East, is uh, interesting because it's not the way we write liturgical texts today. Yeah. Uh, liturgical texts today are based around, they're written sort of like a script, <laughs> right? Where it's like, yeah. this person says this, this person says that. And then they have rubrics, which are like the stage directions. Okay, right. now say, you uh, walk over here. Right? Yeah, as they say, say the black, do the red. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because yeah. it's because because the, the the spoken parts are traditionally, you know, if, if, if for, for especially for those of you who are not clergy and have never looked at liturgical books that clergy use, the parts that you're supposed to say are written typically in black ink, and the parts you're supposed to do are written in red ink, at least in a better better uh, service book. So yeah, say the black, do the red. Right. And so it'll say, you know, say this prayer and then, you know, sing, swing the censer in this direction three times and then that direction three times and then, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Walk over here. Right. Uh, and so ancient Near Eastern ritual texts uh, sometimes are written as stories. Hmm. So rather than, for example, being written as instructions, it will tell the story uh, of some event in the life of the gods and or uh, the people performing the ritual in ancient days uh, that the ritual is based on reenacting and participating in. Hmm. But it's just telling the story. Yeah. So we don't know exactly what they did <laughs> right at various points. Yeah. Uh, or we'll have prayers and hymns, but we don't get you know, we'll have like, this is the hymn that they sing when they offer the incense. Okay. When, how do, you when do they do that? How <laughs> often? They, yeah. How, how much? What kind? Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so before we kind of get um, into those kinds of interesting details, uh, we actually do have a caller. We have Ryan who is uh, calling from Florida and uh, Ryan, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Father. Welcome, Ryan, to the Lord of Spirits. Uh, it is uh, good to talk to you. So what's your question or comment for us tonight? Yes, well, it's um, tangentially related to the topic, I suppose, but um, it's more related to something that Father Stevens talked about uh, in the Five-ish Fall of Angels and, and on his own podcast as well, um, something that's puzzled me. Um, and he's talked about the angels that were assigned to the nations and how there was this I guess you could call it a, an angelic apostasy. They uh, began accepting worship and, and interacting with humans in not-so-kosher ways. Uh, yeah. So I guess my, my, my question there is, um, was this fall of the, these you know, angels, was it universal? Did they all experience this fall? And, and if so, what made it so universal? And then just to follow up, what would it have looked like had that fall not occurred if they had... Um, done their task rightly, um, rather than accepting worship and, and encouraging this idolatry, what would that have looked like? Okay, well, Father Stephen, I'm definitely going to let you address the first part, because <laughs> you were called out specifically, but yeah. <laughs> since, since there is someone who listens to this show who's convinced that this show and the Amon Sul podcast are truly the same, I'm going to throw him a bone and say that <laughs> what, would it, what would it have looked like if they hadn't fall, fallen? I think that it would look like the way that the Valar function in the Silmarillion. Now, Ryan, I don't know if you're a Tolkien fan, uh, I, but if I you are, I'm a huge Tolkien fan. I, I came to uh, basically came to Orthodoxy through Amun Sul. I, I'm not a, I'm not Orthodox. I'm not even a catechumen, but I'm uh, prayerfully Yet. considering it now. So, yeah, yes. <laughs> Yet. that's right, Father. Yeah. <laughs> so there we are. No, I mean I'm serious. Like, I, I, obviously, there's a lot of non-Tolkien readers out there who are like, "What is he talking about? The Valar or whatever." But it's 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 an image of angelic beings. So J.R. Tolkien, the author, he writes this. This is in the Silmarillion. So this is not his most well-known work. It's it's second tier in terms of being well-known. Um, but in that work, these angelic beings that are created by the one God, uh, they help to take care of the earth and also. Uh, human beings and, and elves, of course, as well, who are sort of uh, kind of two different versions of one species, so to speak. Um, and they help to beautify the earth and to form it um, and to, to teach things to mankind. And it's and it's and it's a good relationship. I mean, it, it has it has its problems, but they don't fundamentally go off the deep end. I mean, one of them does. Uh, so it, I, I think that that's a good image of what it would have looked like, 
right? Um, and and maybe we can understand Tolkien's version of this as what it might have looked like bef- before, uh, you know, after the Tower of Babel, but before this fall that that was being discussed. So that's that's my idea for the the second part. So Father Stephen, why don't, why don't you uh, why don't you address the first? Yeah, well, the it seems to have been near universal. Uh, Saint uh, Dionysus the Areopagite and and others. Uh, you see this in in uh, Eusebius's uh, Eusebius of Caesarea's explanation of the Gospel, also for example. Um, the exception is Saint Michael, uh, who was uh, the prince of Israel, uh, as Daniel says. Right? Daniel talks. He talks about the prince of Persia. Uh, Gabriel talks about the Prince of Persia. He talks about the uh, Prince of Greece and that he says, Michael, your prince. Right. So the angel assigned to Israel, uh, St. Michael, the archangel is is sort of the uh, the one exception to that. Um, and so I, I think, you know, building off of what Father Andrew said, I think the best image we can get biblically uh, in terms of what that would look like is Israel. That doesn't mean that, uh, for example, the people didn't fall into egregious sin. Obviously they did, right? In terms of their their behavior and faithfulness, there was not a lot of difference between most of Israel and the neighboring nations, even though there was supposed to be. Um, But uh, there was always a sort of a, a different relationship uh, between God and Israel. Um, and I think the, the intercessions of, of St. Michael and of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and others were part of, part of that difference, um, in terms of, uh, the long suffering that God showed, not to say that they influenced God, right. But that God chose to work through their prayers and intercessions to extend his mercy, uh, to mm-hmm. Israel um, in a way that, uh, now God also showed, according to St. Paul in, in Romans, uh, he showed a certain amount of mercy to the nations in overlooking their sins for a period of time, (laughs) right? Until the gospel came, not immediately punishing them for the wickedness and sin that abounded in, uh, among the nations. Um, and that's sort of St. Paul's theme when he speaks to Gentiles in Acts 17, you know, in the past, God has overlooked all of this, but now the gospel is coming to you. Now you're accountable, right? Now you need to hear the call. And I think what's in the background, what what we've been talking about already tonight is the material side of that, right? So when we talk about, well, these, these angelic spirits started to appear to and interact with and encounter the peoples of the world, and started to influence them. And then we talk about how they started to give them these cultural innovations and these kind of things, right? And what we've been talking about anthropologically in the first part of the program is the material side of that, where we see human beings encountering some kind of spiritual reality at these places. And then that being the engine that leads to agriculture, the first city, right? Cain builds the first city, right? The first kind of permanent settlements, the first uh, domestication of animals, all of these sort of innovations that start metalworking starts in the Chalcolithic period uh, that we're talking about. Um, Just like the genealogy of Cain says. Uh, So this is really the flip side of that, right? We were talking about the spiritual reality of that in the Five-ish Falls, and now we're sort of talking about the historical human side of that. Hmm. Does that, does that make sense to you, Ryan? Yes, definitely. That that was a, an excellent answer. I, I really appreciate all that all that you do. This is such a an enlightening podcast, and um, you know, good blessings on it for sure. Thank you by your prayers. Yeah, you said you thought that your question was tangential, but actually, it, it fed directly <laughs> directly into what we're talking about because you know uh, this does connect back to that earlier stuff. And like Father Stephen said, now we're looking at what is the human sort of interaction response to uh, to uh, you know when fallen angels do their thing so thank you very much ryan thanks for listening thank you all right father so we were just talking rubrics um, yeah. <laughs> right and so 
We, yeah. we don't start getting sort of a, a more full-orbed picture until we get to Greco-Roman sacrifices, yeah. where we could piece together from a number of sources and descriptions sort of the details of how some of these things played out. Right, because now you've got written texts, for instance, where you can get this kind of detail. Um, and so now we're fast-forwarding again thousands of years <laughs> to, you know, 500 B.C. to around... A.D. 150, right? The sort of high Roman period, you know? Right, and, right. And Greek Greece and then Roman Greece. period. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, but, but, I mean, these, these aren't things that they made up when they first started writing them down. No, <laughs> right? right. They were right. practices in the Indo-European world. And um, we'll probably talk about a specific case of this in the third half, but... Uh, even the terminology that's used in Greek to describe these things is are borrowed Semitic words. Yeah. So there is this sort of direct continuity in terms of religious ritual at the Ur level um, between even the ancient Near Eastern and Mesopotamian cultures and Egyptian cultures and then what we're about to talk about now in more detail in the Greco-Roman sort of pattern yeah. Yeah. Uh, that emerges. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about what does an ancient sacrifice look like. It has generally some recognizable parts, pretty universal. Um, how does it actually work? So the right. first part is a procession. People walk in in a line. <laughs> People process. <laughs> where, yeah, yeah. Where, right. Where are they going? They're going yeah. to the place where this needs to happen. It could be a temple. It could be a grove. It could be, I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities, but right. it's a could designated... be an altar, altar yeah. on top of a hill, right? A high place, right. a hill or a mountain. Right, right. But uh, it's a designated spot. And it's like we said earlier, it's because this spot has a spiritual significance. There's been actual experiences there. Right, right. And so, of course, the most, the most common form that hospitality takes is the sharing of a meal. Exactly. Right. And we've we've become a little disconnected from this in modern American culture. Uh, a lot of times now families don't even eat meals together, <laughs> you yeah. know, let alone, you know, gather with other families or other people to have communal meals. Uh, and now you've got of, even Uber Eats, you know, yeah. food can just <laughs> show up at your doorstep. Uh, uh, right. But <laughs> but in. In a lot, a lot of our uh, Orthodox brothers and sisters from other cultures could actually help us out a lot with this, because in a yeah. lot of other cultures, Greek culture, Middle Eastern cultures, um, uh, and and even Slavic cultures, that there's more of a sense of this has been maintained of the importance in, of sharing a meal together and and the significance yeah. of that. It's um, the thing a family does, and to get invited into that is huge. Right, yeah. and and so. Uh, this is how like community is built. And so uh, the way that a that hospitality is going to be offered to a God and some kind of fellowship and communion with that spirit is going to take place is going to be in the form of sharing a meal mm -hmm. with it primarily amongst yeah. other forms of hospitality, but primarily a meal. And so that's what sacrifice is. Right. Uh, and so this procession sort of begins the process pun semi-intended um, <laughs> of, of doing this. And so in these processions, the, the, the practical side of the procession is you have these elements that are going to be sacrificed. Right. Uh, that's not necessarily, we, we tend to think of uh, animals primarily and in some more horrible cases, humans. Uh, but we tend to think of animals a, a, as the primary thing. But there are also... Plenty of sacrifices. In fact, most sacrifices did not involve killing animals. Mm. Uh, the majority of sacrifices were of, for example, wheat cakes uh, or rice cakes if you're in Asia, depending on where you are, grain, right? Cakes made with grain. Um, it would also then include uh, food animals. Uh, these were domesticated food animals, not like wild animals. You wouldn't go right. capture a wild animal and to yeah. sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to have someone over, you know, you, <laughs> yeah, you, you bring out, this is what we've been preparing. This is what we've been working on, you know. Right. Kill the, you're kill the fatted them, calf. 
<laughs> you're offering them something of yours. Right. 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 Something that, that of yours that you're offering to them. And it's um, notable. It's notable that it's always food. Sacrifices are always food. It's it's not, you know, and, and I think, you know, you made this point, but I just want to underline this, that a lot of people have the sense that ancient sacrifice was always about killing an animal, putting it on an altar, whatever, but it wasn't even always an animal, but it was always food. You know, you don't sacrifice a chair, <laughs> you, you know, right. you, you sacrifice something that can be eaten because it's a communal meal. That's, that's exactly what's, what's going on here. So... Yeah. yeah. When, when I when I read in Wizards of the Coast that in uh, fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, dwarf priests sacrifice metal, <sighs> I was just like, this is so unrealistic. Please, people. <laughs> exactly. Please. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, so related. To, so re- I don't know if I'll recover from that one. Uh, so related to yeah. that um, is we, we do have a caller. Uh, we have Samuel calling from uh, the God-protected dominion of virginia uh where i happen to have been born um and and he has a question specifically about this so samuel can are you there yeah i'm I'm there thank you for taking my call fathers you're welcome it's it's good to hear from you so so what's on your mind samuel i'm wondering uh what it how how it changes things because obviously it does when god himself is the sacrifice sacrificial meal being offered that's a that's a really good question. I'd love to say we'll just tune in next time because that's yeah. what we're going to be talking about, among other things. But but I mean, just to just you know, we, we don't want to leave you with nothing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say this: so all of the stuff that we're talking about with regards to paganism now, which is kind of what this particular uh, episode is about, it it becomes fulfilled completely in the Christian context where not only are we having, you know, sacrificing to our God, sharing a meal with our God, but that he himself is the one who is sacrificed and shared. Right. So how does that change? Um, there's a hundred things we could say about this, but um, it, it's, it's that the, the life that we receive, for instance, this is the first thing that occurs to me to say, the life that we receive from this is eternal life. It's not temporary, right? Um, and it is and it is deifying. It changes us. So it not only puts us in communion with Him, as all sacrifices always did to whatever God, um, but but makes you know, and not only makes us like Him, as all sacrifices do to whatever God. We're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here a little bit. But that's okay. Um, but 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 you know, grants eternal life and elevates us to become, as we've said before, the sons of God. So that's, that's the response I would give initially to that. Father Stephen, is there anything you want to add or correct or whatever? Well, yeah, to, to show our cards a little bit for the next couple of episodes. Um, yeah. We're, we're, we're laying some groundwork here in terms of what sacrifice looks like in the world at large. And what we're going to see next time already in the Old Testament sacrifices is that God is going to take a lot of the spiritual quote-unquote wisdom and understanding of the nations and invert it in the sacrificial ritual that's done uh, in uh, Israel, or that's prescribed for Israel at least. Um, And then Christ's sacrifice that we're going to be talking about more two episodes from now in our third episode is sort of the fulfillment of that and the ultimate inversion of of what pagan sacrifice is uh and one of the key elements is is exactly what you're hitting on that rather than it being a spirit taking something from humans or seeking to be appeased by humans uh god meets us in sacrifice with self-offering yeah he offers himself to us which is a direct inversion of of this pagan idea he's the one giving the hospitality (laughs) you know so, but yeah, so just, just hang on and keep listening, Samuel, <laughs> you know, for uh, two weeks from today and then four weeks from today, because this is, this is a first in a series of three. I'm so excited. Does that make sense, Samuel? Yeah, it does. And Father Stephen, when you mentioned Dungeons and Dragons right before taking my call, it, I, I'm actually playing as a dwarf cleric as one of my current characters, and I <laughs> often get nitpicking about that sort of, that exact thing in fantasy settings. 
Yeah, you need to do you need to do beer and ale drink offerings and keep go. it real. Keep it real. That's right. Exactly. All right. Well, thank yeah. you very much for calling, Samuel. Good to talk to you. Yeah, you too, fathers. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we've got food being offered. It's brought in a procession. Uh, it's domesticated animals. It's wheat cakes. It's wine. It's oil. Uh, you know, if you're a dwarf all, cleric, all, it's beer. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's all food. Right? Yeah, it's all food. Um, exactly, exactly. So what's the so next the, thing that has to be done with it? The the practical element of the procession is you need to get that stuff to, to the, the place table. where you're sacrificing yeah. it. Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, so, right. So there's that practical element. But so then in the procession, the procession is not just made like, okay, well, hey, take all, hey, buddy, take all this stuff over to the altar, right? It's done as a, as a festal procession. So there's incense uh, that's being offered. There's music, uh, at yep. least singing, sometimes instrumentation uh, as the people process uh, to, that, to that place. Right. Uh, and the, the, if there's animals involved, those animals are still alive at this point. Right and are and are being brought and transported. Yeah, probably um, led led on leashes or whatever. Yeah. yeah, one one biblical element of this is people may be familiar with the Psalms that are labeled as the Psalms of Ascent, A S C E N T. Uh, right. Those are the psalms that were sung by people as they made their pilgrimage to Jerusalem with their animals, with their things that they were bringing to sacrifice. Uh, uh, so that pilgrimage was turned into a grand procession. Uh, yeah of this type right so then once they get to the place uh the uh elements they're going to be sacrificed need to be sanctified they need to be made holy which means they need to be designated for that purpose right like this is going to be used for this and and not and this over here is not going to be used right so it's not it's not that everything that's brought is necessarily used sometimes it's just pieces of it right right sometimes part, yeah right. yeah exactly right um so they have to be designated that's usually with uh the laying on of hands right um there's also though uh this idea that's embedded of the the animals involved being sort of willing participants yeah that's kind of an interesting element um and and i you know as we were talking about this there's actually a token of this to sort of prove this and i and, and you know and, so the idea of course is that animals are like yes i'm happy to be sacrificed to zeus or whoever yes um i'm glad i know, was chosen for this noble purpose uh, right yeah. right yeah. right now obviously the animal is not saying that but it's right. it's 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 ritually sort of um tokenized by a tuft of their hair being cut out and then that hair that was cut off is then placed in the incense so it's it's that the animal is offering himself now by this little gift of this offering of hair that has been cut off and is being burned up with with the incense we're going to talk about incense more later um yeah. But but yeah, I thought that was a really interesting thing, and 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 like animals are not tortured in the process. Um, it's 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 really a peaceful sort of slaughtering, frankly, um, you know, and 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 that the the killing itself is not really part of the ritual. It's just a necessary element. If it is going to be an animal sacrificed, it's a necessary element in order for the sacrifice to be possible, right? To be eaten. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't eat <laughs> like live um, yeah. animals. Yeah. 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 So, right. So, and, and that's important because Western theology has put into our heads that sacrificing something is killing it. Killing it. Yeah. That the, the, that the, the death, that the death is the key element. And that there's suffering involved somehow. But what we see in ancient sacrifices is the exact opposite. Yeah. Not only is the killing not ritualized, there's no instructions by and large for how to kill things. Yeah, you just in the Old them. Testament or in these ancient rituals, um, there are ways that they tended to do it with certain animals, just for ease of handling in terms of yeah. the procedure, right? But, but there was no specific ritualization of the killing, and this little bit of ritualization with the the tuft of hair being grabbed and cut, but that that ritualization of the animal offering itself 
is signifying the exact opposite of the animal <laughs> suffering yeah. or being afraid or being killed. Uh, yeah. It's it's sort of voluntarily offering itself as well. Right. And I'm told, and I'm I'm not a butcher or a <laughs> farmer of any kind. Uh, you know, I'm told that an animal that's tortured before it dies, actually, that it it does bad things to the the taste even. So like, it, it would be not it would be against your best interests, right? You know, if you're offering hospitality to your god, you're going to offer it an animal that's freaked out and sort of tastes the worst. You know, um, so you wouldn't you wouldn't want to do that again. Not a farmer, not a shepherd. So I don't know if we've got any cattle ranchers out there. He'd be like, oh, no, no, no. That's completely an urban legend, Father Rich. I don't know. But it is something that I have heard. It is yeah. something that I have heard. Something you've heard, pun not intended. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so the, the other bit that we know a little about in terms of how the animal was killed is based on the fact that uh, the blood was going to be collected. Right. Yeah, And so that means that in a lot of cases, the animal's throat would be slit because that was the easiest way to drain all the blood out of the animal before it was butchered. Right. Um, and uh, the blood would be collected in a bowl. Um, blood, it's not just Leviticus that says that blood is life. Yeah, <laughs> right? That's the life is the in the blood. Universal, ancient, ancient thing. So there were, there were mi a minority of rituals... Uh, this was actually more common in human sacrifice than animal sacrifice, where the blood would be drunk by right. uh, the participants. But far more commonly, uh, and especially in Greco-Roman practice, uh, at the various shrines, in addition to the shrine to the god or spirit or muse or whoever, right, uh, the Caesar, whoever, there would also be a grave of a hero. Mm. And hero was kind of a technical term in Greek, right? It's yeah. not just, we, we say someone is my hero. But heroes <laughs> were the founders of cities, people like Perseus, Theseus, who did yeah. these great deeds uh, in the past. Uh, but no matter how great the deeds were that you did, when you died, you still went to Hades and became a shade. And you had this sort of shadowy existence as a shadow of your former self. Uh, that lasted until everyone had forgotten you, and then you just sort of ceased to be. It's and, like Tinkerbell. She disappears yeah. if you don't believe in her. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, so you would have these these grave shrines in part to keep their memory alive. Right. And then the blood would be taken and would be fed to them by pouring it out into their grave. Yeah. Uh, the blood from these sacrifices. And this happens in the Odyssey, doesn't it? Yeah, in the Odyssey, there's a point where Odysseus needs to talk to Achilles, who is dead, of course. Uh, and so to do this, he goes to one of the many places where there's a gateway to, the, to Hades, to the underworld. Uh, see our future episode on uh, sacred geography. Um, yes. But he goes to one of these places and sacrifices some black goats and pours their blood out into a pool. And the blood sort of attracts the shades up out of the gateway to come mm. and drink the blood uh, in the Odyssey. And uh, that ultimately lures out Achilles so that uh, Odysseus can uh, communicate with him. So that is in story form what's going on in the sacrificial ritual with the grave of the hero and the, and wow. the blood. Yeah. Okay. So blood being drained... <laughs> Right. You now have an animal if there's an animal involved uh, and the cakes and the wine and the oil that are being sacrificed. Those were then brought to a place called the prothesis. Mm -hmm. That was the right. Greek name for it. Yep. And that's the place where the elements were, were further prepared. Uh, so the animal would have to be butchered. Uh, and divided up into the different parts. There would be parts that were going to be offered uh, to the god or gods or spirits. There would be a portion that was going to be eaten by the, the priests and celebrants, and then there was a portion that was going to be eaten by the people. Uh, right, right. There's this cutting celebrating up. Celebrating yeah. the, the sacrifice. And so those pieces had to be divided out. Yeah. Um, and, and, this, if it's, this... and if it's an animal, right, you're basically doing butchering you're right. cutting <laughs> cutting an animal up. but if it's 
you know, cakes or something like that, you're kind of saying, okay, here's the best cake. Here's the not as good right. cake, you know, uh, whatever. You're cutting them out and you're pouring the oil and wine onto the cakes or onto the, the uh, meat that's going to be offered. Yep. Yep. And then the, uh, the elements that were going to be offered to the uh, God were taken to the altar. Right. Um, and the word, um, just as a side note, in Latin, the word ara means both altar and table. Right. Uh, these, aren't, these aren't two different words. Uh, there's not a difference between a sacrifice and a meal and an altar and a table in the ancient world. Uh, I say that, um, and uh, our Protestant friends will understand why that's significant, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. that there's not a difference between an altar and a table. Um, but uh, so those elements are brought, and the ones, uh, what's going to be offered to the gods is uh, immolated. Burnt up. Burnt right, up. And, and yeah, yeah, which like if you, you know, I, I remember this was a long time ago, actually, I was doing some some fiction writing and I was asking you questions about this because like, OK, I, I, you know, burning up parts of an animal. Fine. I've burned plenty of roasts in my time. I know how you do that. But like, what about burning a, a cake or something like that? You know, and, and 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 that's when the point when you said that's what the oil is for. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so if you've got a cake, you know, and these are not cake. This is not cake like birthday cake. OK, these are just like right. flat. Yeah. Flat you know, crunchy or whatever. Um, right. But if you put oil on it there, it's much more likely to light on fire. Yeah. And the, uh, the wine is a uh, little higher proof than uh, right. a lot of our right. wine, which yeah. also and causes it to burn. Yeah, it gets poured out. And that's the idea is that's the way that the God consumes it is when it's lit on fire. Right. The smoke rises up into the, into the heavens, right? And it's, it's an aromatic kind of thing because yeah even ancient people realized that smell and taste were closely connected right, right. As, as senses right um, right and there's this cool element in the midst of this which i thought was really interesting right which is there's a specific act when this stuff is brought to the altar right and what what is that right. the the last thing before the portions uh for the spirits being offered to is burnt is and the language that's used is that the 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 gifts that are being given to the the god or gods or spirits are touched and elevated touched and elevated uh, and that's the the final thing before um, what follows which is the burning of what goes to uh the spirits and then the following feast which is the elements that go to the the priests and yeah. the, the people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So before we get to that, I want to go ahead and take another break. And uh, when we get back, we actually have someone calling from Indiana who has a question about guardian angels. Uh, but first we're going to go ahead and go to a break. So we'll be right back. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855 237 Two three four six. That's eight five five A F radio. Are you struggling in your walk with Christ? Do you want to rediscover your reason for living, the person you were created to be? Renewing you, a priest, a psychologist, and a plan gives you the keys to unlock areas of your life that hold you back from fully experiencing the renewal and transformation God has in mind for you. Co-authored by a priest and a psychologist, Father Nicholas and Dr. Roxanne Lowe, Renewing You combines principles of spiritual growth with psychological tools to help you become your best self, fully connected with God's purpose for you. To purchase this book, please go to store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits. With Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855 237 2346. That's 855 AF Radio. 
Welcome to the third half of the Lord of Spirits. And yes, we're saying that quite on purpose, the third half. Uh, Before we get to the feast that comes as the next part of the sacrificial ritual, we have a call from, I think it's Christiana from Indiana. Am I I saying your name right? Are you there? Uh, Yes, I'm here. And yeah, it's uh, Christiana. Oh, good. (laughs) It's it's always tough when someone mispronounces your name. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, re- I people call me Christina so often that my aunt, who is actually named Christina, I say yes. What when I hear her name at family reunions? <laughs> oh man! Well, it, it's lovely to talk to you, Christiana. And uh, what is the question that you have for us this evening? Uh, yeah, thanks so much for uh, taking my call. So it's actually three questions, but I promise they're all great. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, we've got the time. <laughs> Yeah, so guardian angels, what happens to our guardian angel after we die? Do they get assigned Mm. to a new person? Do they cease to exist? Do they go up to heaven and join the heavenly host and sing praises? Do they hang out with us on the new earth? Do we have a relationship with them? Do do we ever get to meet them face-to-face in heaven now that we can see angels up there? Yeah. Okay. Well, do you want to give all three of us at once and, and all three of your questions at once or, or, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah. What's so number say, one? I, can, I, I can answer that one real quick. It's yes, no, no, yes, no, <laughs> yes, no yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Next. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> joking. Just I'll kidding. Give, we'll give just kidding. Point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Well, <laughs> Father, what, 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 so, okay, yeah, because I don't really, I don't really know the answer to this one. So, Father Stephen, why don't you take a crack at it? Right. Well, um, yeah, so, um, as we talked about a little bit last time, uh, what is it like to be a bat, right? Um, angels don't experience sort of space the way we do, right? So, it's, it's not like they're either here or in heaven, right? Or, right? Um, so, you know, Christ says about guardian angels, about the guardian angels of, of little children, that their angels are always before his, his father in heaven, but that doesn't mean they're like not with the children, right? That's just saying that, that they have this prominent place, um, in, in the divine council, meaning God is very attentive to what's going on with these children and he's protective of them, um, is what that's indicating. So um, we don't necessarily have an angel who's like only our guardian angel and has never been the guardian angel of any human before or of any human in the future. Um, and that's okay, right? Just like we have pa- a patron saint who's the patron saint of a bunch of other people and has been the patron saint of a bunch of other people. Um, and so uh, I think the last piece of that that I didn't answer yet is that yes we will be able to uh, get to know them in the world to come. All right. Okay. What else you got, Christiana? That's so, that's, that's inspiring. That's so exciting. Um, Yeah. Okay. So second question, does our guardian angel carry our soul to heaven after we die? I saw this on an, uh, on, on a uh, page that sold icons and in the description, it was a, it was a, um, I was looking for uh, some pro-life sort of icons and there was one where it's a guardian angel and a baby. Um, you know, one that, you know, the one that had died, uh, in the womb. Mm. And, um, and in the description, it said that, uh, guardian angels carry your, your soul to heaven after you die. And I'm like, wait a second. I've never heard that before. I, well, I, it, I gotta ask this. Yeah. So, I mean, it's certainly the case that we see in saints lives that uh, angels come to take the souls of the righteous to paradise. I mean, that's now whether, I don't know whether you could say, oh, oh, here's the guardian angel and then six other friends he's brought with him. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not usually named in the, the same slides I've, I've read. Um, but the idea that, that angels do accompany the soul to paradise is pretty, pretty well established, I would say. I don't know. Is there something specific about the guardian angel, Father Stephen? 
Right. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, we as, as Orthodox Christians, we believe that a person's soul takes a journey uh, after they die, usually corresponding to 40 days, but that, yeah, our guardian angel accompanies us on that journey there you um, go. on the way. Yeah. Yeah. Better than Beatrice and Dante. Boom. That's, that's for Richard Rowland. I know you're listening. <laughs> I think you were, I think you were thinking of Virgil and Dante. Oh, excuse me. You're right. Well, Beatrice is, is, uh, the one who, who comes to him, I think in the Paradiso, right? Um, yeah, but that's anyway. the boring one. Nobody reads that far. It's all about the Inferno. <laughs> Come on. So they're reading okay. about purgatory, please. Uh, that's right. All right, Christiana, what's your, what's your third and final question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When do we get our guardian angels? Do we get them when we're born, when we're baptized, or when we're chrismated if that's different from when we're baptized? Well, definitely at baptism, right? Um, cause in the baptismal service, it's specifically prayed for as part of that, especially the part actually right before the baptism itself. Um, you know, the, the, the exorcisms and so forth at the beginning. Um, what else though? I mean, I mean, there, there are certainly are cases where angels are, I mean, I think part of the problem, right, is that God assigns angels to, to take care of us, to guide us, to pray for us, to defend us, all these kinds of things. Um, and, and we have this concept of a guardian angel, but I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's like, okay, this one has this hat on, right? Um, so certainly angels are involved in people's lives at every point. Um, but there is definitely this kind of connection that happens with baptism. I don't know. I don't know if I'm making any sense here. Father Stephen, please help me out. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a, a por que no los tres. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Why not all three? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because, again, we, I keep coming back to what it's like to be a bat. Um, we experience time as humans, right, as this, this succession of moments, right? And we can try to literalize that when we're talking about God, right? So we say... Well, okay, this is this is the point where I really came to understand the gospel of Christ. Hmm. If I died five minutes before that, what would have happened, right? See, we can think that way, yeah. right? But we're kind of assuming that, like, God and the angels are on this parallel track with us. It's experiencing time the way we do, right? Or, like, God didn't know or whatever. So... Um, there, there, there are events in our lives that we experience in our lives at a particular period of time, right? At a particular point in time. But their reality isn't limited to that point in time. So something changes for me at that moment. Something doesn't change for God. Yeah. And something doesn't necessarily change for an angel. So for me at my baptism or chrismation, right? There's a guardian angel who I enter into this relationship with, but that doesn't mean that the angel was sort of sitting around waiting to be assigned up until that point, <laughs> right? Like in a waiting room, like out, outside, you know, when I was being born, you know, pacing with my dad, right? Um, or that, that God was, you know, getting ready and thinking about which one he would assign, right? Like that's silly. Um, for me, yeah, that's the point, but the reality of it extends not just forward from there, but also back mm. from there. Does that make time. sense, Christiana? Yeah, that does. Uh, but I'm a little confused. Clarifying question. Um, do we only have one guardian angel or do we have many that kind of like hang around, also pray for other people? Well, like... We have we have a guardian angel. Yeah, we have we have a guardian angel, but we also ha can have a patron saint. Our family can have a patron saint. Our church can have a patron saint. Um, if you go to my church, that's Archangel Gabriel, right? So he's sort of the guardian angel of my whole parish. Um, so there's a lot of overlap. Yes, there there there's lots of folks praying for us. Um, yeah. But there, our guardian angel is an angel, right? Who is who is connected to our life? Yeah. All right. Well, I hope that that helps 
And now you got four questions, Christiana. So that is literally more than anyone else has ever gotten in the whole history of this podcast. Well, so. uh, something, <laughs> I'm going to say something biblical about demanding something and then God listens. Oh, yeah, the righteous, the unrighteous judge. Something yeah. like that. <laughs> the, yes, persistent, exactly. the persistent widow. The yeah. widow. There you go. The widow and the judge. Well, there you go. All right. Well, great to talk to you. And I, and I hope that helps. Thank you very much for calling and for listening, yeah. Christiana. All right. Thanks for Bye. taking the questions. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. So we've just uh, burnt a calf liver, and <laughs> now it's time to party. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. So, yeah. yeah. Because uh, what follows that burning at the altar is the feast. Right. Um, where everyone's going to eat. And this isn't just a question of eating the things that were actually sacrificed, right? Like the other right. pieces of the animal, right? Or right. the there's, other wheat there's, cakes. Yeah, there's, there's, there's side dishes, right? right? At these feasts. And this is, this is the word for today, right? The, the, the word for today is trapezomata. Trapezomata. Which yes. literally means table things. But table stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, those yeah are trap, the... trap is, a, is the table. Yeah, yeah. And so those are the other things that were eaten along with the sacrificial uh, feast. And so, for example, the Temple of Demeter in Corinth um, had huge dining halls, mm. banquet halls. Yeah. And that wasn't to rent out for, like, wedding receptions. That was <laughs> part of the sacrificial worship was everybody going and eating. Yeah, uh, and 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 the the important th at least one of the important things to get from the fact of side dishes is to em emphasize that this really was a, a meal. It, it you know it was really a, a meal that was shared together. Right, and this created uh, the the uh, kinonia in Greek, the fellowship, the communion. It it formed the community. Right. Uh, and that included the God or gods or spirits and yeah. and the humans bound them together. Uh, right. And uh, we'll probably talk about this more in a, in a further episode. But uh, this is in the background of what St. Paul is talking about in Corinthians to the, the mem Christians at Corinth about not eating at an idol's temple, not eating food offered to idol, and also about... Uh, becoming a communicant, having communion with demons by participating in yeah. these meals. Right? Yeah, it's not, just a, it's not just about don't eat the bad food. <laughs> There's right. a ritual event that's occurring. Um, and and it's, it's, it is a religious, it is quite literally a religious experience. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and usually, if I recall correctly... Um, especially once you get to the Greco-Roman period, uh, the next thing that typically happens is a lot of immorality um, along with it as well. Well, right, because, yeah, it's not just a feast like, hey, let's sit down and have a potluck. It's yeah. a party. Yeah, in the worst um, possible way. Yes, in, in the full-orbed 1980s sense, yeah. Yeah, um, and, 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 and all of this, especially like the detail of it, kind of just underlines what priests were in the ancient world, right? Like nowadays, we tend to think of priests largely as pastors, which is why there was this wonderful rumor that went around as soon as long as I was no longer a pastor, that I was no longer a priest anymore. Um, <laughs> um, not true. Still, You, still you are still frocked. Yes, the, the frocking continues. Um, yeah, um, but that priests in the ancient world were largely not pastors. They weren't doing pastoral counseling. They weren't, you know, all that kind of stuff. They weren't administrators. Uh, they were kind of ritual technicians. They were specialists in exactly how you do all this stuff precisely, uh, exactly how you do it in the way uh, that the God expected, right? Because like there was the idea that you could do this wrong. Um, and also there was often um, divination that went along with it, right? Like, you know, parts of the animals being cut open and, and uh, reading what's in the entrails and using that to predict the future and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and that's what priests did. That's what their job was, uh, was all of that. 
and 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 I think you know, and then one of the things that's underlined by that is you can get it wrong. Like the God might decide he wasn't into the sacrifice. He might reject your <laughs> invitation to dinner or having tasted of it, um, you know, say, no, you did this wrong. Right. Right. We've all been to a dinner party that went bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where things went, went uh, sideways. Um, and that could happen with the gods too. Right. Someone right. could say the wrong right. thing, do the wrong thing, offer the wrong type of food, um, make some kind of faux pas right? in terms of the um, the manners required at, at such a function. And so, yeah, yeah part of, a big part of the reading of entrails that a priest called a haruspex would do. Um, and we've got one of the things we find a lot are these hardened, fired clay like models, like scale models of like livers and kidneys from animals yeah. with writing, like cuneiform writing on them, indicating what to look for in the different parts. Part of it was that was his job was to read whether they were doing it right or not and whether the offering was being accepted or not because they believed mm. there would be signs. Probably one of the most dramatic of these is, is once before uh, the Roman armies went into a really disastrous battle uh, the priest who was doing the butchering at the prothesis discovered that the animal they just killed had no heart. Oh, that's a and bad so, sign. Yeah, that was taken to be a really bad sign. Um, <laughs> and lo and behold, they lost, right? Uh, so, yeah. so they yeah. were looking <laughs> for those kind of things uh, yeah, I, to indicate. It, 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 I was going to say, this makes me think of like when you go to the doctor. Right. And um, like now I'm going to have to make Horospex jokes the next time I go to the doctor and they're looking at a, 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 a an X-ray or something like that. I'm like, so, you know, what do you read there, doctor? You know, as he quietly chuckles to himself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. So, OK, well, um, we're, we've we've taken up most of our time, but um, there's something that kind of goes along with all of this. Right. And that's. And that's a question that probably a lot of people would have, like, okay, well, okay, the offering of food, whether it's meat or, you know, cakes or wine or oil, puts you in communion with the God. That's an offering. It's a, it's a, it's a shared meal. It's a communal experience, you know. So, but what about all this incense that comes along with it? What's the deal there? Is that a sacrifice too, Right. Right. And we've already mentioned in the procession uh, and some of the details right. there that incense was being uh, used there. And incense is offered. That's the language we use. Uh, incense uh, was offered on altars. There were altars of incense. Uh, right. In, in all cultures. Right. Uh, but also, as we'll talk about more next time in the tabernacle, in the temple, there was an incense altar. And that altar was actually used more than the altar of burnt offerings hmm. um, because that was the incense offerings were the basis of the daily cycle, right? At morning and evening yeah. um, with, with prayers. Um, and so um, incense is taken to this altar and is offered. And the language that's used about the aroma and the smell rising up is the same language that's used about the aroma of the burnt offerings uh, hmm. rising up and, and the smell. Um, right. So there's that piece where it's being offered as this pleasing aroma. Uh, it's being offered with prayer. Prayers are being attached to it. Yeah. <laughs> right? So it's this pleasing um, that goes, goes, you know, you're trying to please the God, just as you're trying to please someone you're offering hospitality to. Right. You're going to ask someone yeah. for a favor. You bring them a gift. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. That's normal. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, so that's the one, the one side. And then the other side of incense offering is uh, there were censers, just like we have now in the Orthodox Church in the ancient world, that were, uh, and they took various forms, but they were basically mobile uh, means of offering incense, right? An yeah. incense altar is a fixed thing, right. uh, <clears throat> at least relatively. Uh, so you would come and you would take some of the coals and some of the incense from the altar and place them in a censer. Right. right. Is, is how it was done. And then the censer could be used to carry that incense to other places. And that could be used in what was called in Mesopotamian religion, fumigation rituals. 
right? <laughs> right. Um, because the idea was you were you were sort of smoking out right? <laughs> the, uh, the area in order to render it sacred and pure. And the Egyptians are really specific about this. They believe that there were sort of aerial spirits. Literally, there were spirits in the air uh, that might be malicious or at least tricksters and yeah. had to be sort of driven out uh, of the, the presence of the, the god in the temple. Uh, right. So, so this, this is like setting off a bug bomb in your house and all the cockroaches right. go scattering, right? Yeah. Except they're demonic uh, cockroaches. Incense demonic is... cockroaches. That's going to be our new meme, everybody. Yeah, they're... <laughs> it's, incense is the demon cleaner, right? So, yeah. <laughs> right. It's, it cleans out cleans out the area. So there's this this purification element. And uh, just a note: uh, if you understand this, you know why you got to keep scooping that incense during services. Mm. If you can still see clearly, it's not enough. Right. Anyway, <laughs> there you go. You got to get that so wavy listen... line at head height, right? Right <laughs> through the building, exactly. Um, but um i totally and, agree <laughs> and and this is this is so embedded uh i i mentioned earlier that the sort of the at the ur level the the greek words that describe religion uh are borrowed semitic words that ultimately come out of akkadian roots yeah. so the oldest altar we know of uh at the lycaon uh in greece uh, is was referred to throughout Greek history as the Bemos, uh, which is from Bema, uh, the Semitic root, which is the word for altar. Mm. Um, and in Greek, it just became the name of that particular one because they lost sight of the etymology. Uh, yeah. But more pertinent to this is the uh, Greek word uh, kathero, which uh, is the verb for to cleanse or to purify. The yeah, noun and the word form yeah, is catharsis. And the yeah, yeah, right. Catharsis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so, Catharsis. and that word is derived from uh, the the Semitic Qatar, which is usually transliterated as QTR. It's uh, Qatar, the verb in Hebrew, um, and uh, just the root cutter in, in Ugaritic. Uh, and that is the verb that means to offer incense. Yeah. So it's interesting that some of these key sacrificial terms, as you said, come from these Semitic practices uh, of the ancient Near East and then make their way even into proto into uh, Indo European languages like Greek, get borrowed right. straight in and sort of Hellenized or Latinized or whatever the case. Right. Yeah. And so to to sense something is not to metaphorically cleanse it. To cleanse something is to metaphorically sense it. In Mic Greek. drop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's exactly yeah. inverted. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, That's going to go on a t-shirt too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's catchy. Um, so. <laughs> it's a chiasm. It's a chiasmus. Sorry. It's a chiasmus. So it's got to be catchy. Um, so, yeah. so that brings us to, and, and I think this is going to lead into what we're going to talk about in our next two episodes, that yeah. you see this clearly with incense. We're going to see this with all forms of sacrifice uh, in the, the Old Testament, the New Testament atonement, that there are these two elements. The one element that is usually described by the Latin term propitiation, mm -hmm. propitiate, to propitiate someone means to make them propitious, and yeah. to be propitious <laughs> means to be happy or well disposed or pleased towards someone yeah not not a, not a word we tend to use in everyday speech you know yeah. how are you doing today oh, i'm very propitious actually thank you yeah <laughs> I, I actually find the word propitious to be quite propinquent to my everyday Boom. life but um <laughs> but so so that's what propitiation means it just means to please someone to make them happy right right it doesn't right whether whether they were angry before or not you're pleasing them and making them happy um and uh, and then the other element that's usually described by the Latin word expiation, which is like purification. Yeah. Right. There are yeah. these two elements and these are present in all sacrifices. We can see them in incense offerings. We'll see them in the other sacrifices that we're going to go on to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, this has been our first episode of three. And so we're just going to give some closing thoughts here. Um, and we appreciate all of those of you who are anticipating our, our next couple episodes. This is, this is so fun already. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just happy to be here. Uh, but I, I just wanted to say, you know, about this context of pagan worship that we've been discussing. Um, you know, if you listen closely, if you know anything, especially about Orthodox Christian worship, there are probably a whole bunch of times during this episode where you thought, wait, wait, I, I know that word, or I know that action, or whatever. And, and, and then we didn't, you know, make the connection for you. We're going to make those connections for you. But we wanted to lay this specific groundwork here initially. And it's not just about a kind of heuristic um, progression, right? It's really about again, reorienting the way that we understand what it is that we do and reorienting the way that we understand what we ought to be doing, right? And and how uh, we ought to be doing it. Um, when you understand that sacrifice in the ancient world does what we just described, and when you understand how it's conducted, then it... it it kind of makes a sort of um, flat secular worldview Im almost impossible, right? You can't, um, it, once you know that you can have a meal with your God and, and be in communion with your God, then that takes what it means to be a, a religious person or Christian in particular, completely out of the realm of this is what I think and feel and believe, right? Although those are important things, um, it's much more primal and visceral, no pun intended. Uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it gets you down in the stomach, quite frankly, right? And um, I think that that's a really important place to aim when you're talking about the stuff that actually is the most important, right? I mean, I'm being a little redundant here. But, but the kind of faithfulness that keeps you returning to God over and over again, the kind of faithfulness that, that is always making your love for Jesus Christ grow is the kind of faithfulness that even connects to your body, which is very much an element of who you are. And I'm talking about the material body here, right? And that there is the whole human person is brought into contact with God through exactly what we've been talking about. Now we've been talking about it in terms of pagans, but if you're, if you listened closely, I'm sure you saw, you heard a lot of stuff that has everything to do with also the worship of the one true God. And that continuity should leap right out at you. Um, and we're going to get to that a lot more in the next couple episodes, but just tonight we want to just sort of show you what does worship in the ancient world look like. And you probably notice it does not, look like what a lot of people call worship now. And it's universally looks almost the same in every culture with just some adjustments here and there. But it's always centered on the offering of food and sharing it with your God, the accompaniment with incense to both please your God and to purify the space and the actions that you're engaging in. So this is really, really important stuff, everybody. And I, and I, I hope that um, I hope that this has been been um, valuable for you, Father. Yeah. So this was this episode, maybe even more than uh, some of the previous ones, uh, especially where we started out, was in some kind of rarefied air, right? Uh, mm, yeah. Yeah. Dig sites from the Neolithic and Chalcolithic periods <laughs> with um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> names we could barely pronounce uh, in Turkish, um, and uh, this may seem kind of disconnected, right? And this isn't just, you know, uh, that, that I should be allowed to shoot my mouth off and I should have a call-in show and everyone should listen to my interesting opinions about fascinating old historical stuff. Um, because frankly, other than, you know, the handful of nerds like me, uh, who would be expected to care about what things were like in, in 10,000 BC. Um, but, the reality is this this cuts to a big part of our mission in this podcast as a whole. Mm. And we've talked before about how disconnected modern 
and postmodern life is um, now sort of digitally disconnected and how disconnected from just reality we've become and how this has affected how we view meaning and our lives and the world, how it's affected human morality, human sexuality, you know, uh, the human understanding of God and of religion, this sort of disconnection. Uh, there, there are four main ways that humans interact with reality. Uh, the first one's language, and we're pretty good at that. We're very much in our heads. We're very linguistically oriented. Um, when we go to worship services in the Orthodox Church or elsewhere, we focus really hard on the words and try to determine what they mean. Uh, then there's music and art are the next two, and those have been lost to varying degrees, and we try to rediscover them. Um, but the fourth one has almost been completely lost by modern humans, and that's ritual. Uh, ritual is not just, you know, smells and bells. We were talking about incense. It's not just um, a performance, a sort of theatrical performance that I enjoy watching. It's not something that induces an emotional experience in me. It's a way of connecting with reality. And that's why we see that worship and especially sacrificial worship, especially sacrifice, this community building around sacred and shared meals and hospitality is something that is basically human. The earliest humans we can find evidence of were practicing it. Humans today can still practice it if we find our way back to it. And this is a way for us to reconnect with the whole element of reality to which we are least now connected, which is the spiritual reality around us. Uh, one of the questions we get asked a lot is, okay, I believe what you're saying on the show is true, but how do I really connect with that? Ritual is the way. Yeah. Right. Ritual is the way. Uh, when we when we attend uh, Orthodox Church services uh, as they're conducted, this isn't just something that's being presented to us to watch or to hear or to think about. It's something to participate in, and that participation will produce actual communion. It will make us into a community with one another. It will bind us together with our fellow Christians and will bind all of us as Christians and our Christian communities together with our God, with our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what this is all aimed at. And uh, so it's not just about me showing off interesting stuff I learned from books about Neolithic religion and boring lectures I sat through that you don't want to. It's about finding our way back into reality and reconnecting with it and reconnecting with God in a real experiential way uh, so that all of this becomes real and true to us and not just something we think or believe. Well, that is our show for tonight. Thank you for listening, everybody. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to call in during the live broadcast, we would love to hear from you either via email at lordofspirits at ancientfaith.com or you can message us at our Lord of Spirits podcast Facebook page. We read everything but cannot respond to everything, uh, and we do save what you send for possible use in future episodes. And join us for our live broadcasts on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, when hopefully in the future I will not be picking up Mexican radio on my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you're on Facebook, like our Facebook page and join our Facebook discussion group. And leave reviews and ratings, but most importantly, share this show with a friend whom you know is going to love it. And finally, be sure to go to ancientfaith.com, stroke support, and help make sure we and lots of other AFR podcasters stay on the air. Thank you very much, and may God bless you always. You've been listening to The Lord of Spirits with Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. 
And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 12.